So um, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about a, uh, a subject which um, I've been interested in for a long time, and which in, in some ways there's been very little progress. But recently there's a, an interesting connection which provides some uh, uh, some some progress on on, uh, on the problem, and it has to do uh, really the main um, theme of the talk is that uh, there are two extremal problems for uh, uh, Riemannian metrics in three dimensions, which turn out to to be related to have a perhaps somewhat unexpected relationship. And uh, I'm going to talk about the, the the main technical result I'll talk about is actually not really due to me. It's due to uh, Hugh Bray and a student of mine named Andre Nabs. And I'll come to that a little later. But I do, I do have some credit in formulating it correctly and recognizing the, um, the relationship between, between the two problems or the possible relationship. So um, what, what I'm interested in are um, particularly um, um, uh, extremal characterizations of nice metrics, particular, say, constant curvature metrics. Um, and, and in fact, actually, th this talk is a little bit related to Jonathan's talk this morning, so it has to do with scalar curvature as well. Now, um, if you look at the two-dimensional case, the case of a two-dimensional surface, um, then um, you know that if you, uh, if you choose on a surface, a, say, a background metric, G0, and then you look at metrics which are informally related to that, and so those are uh, given by um, a function e to the 2u times g0, then <clears throat> there's a simple formula that relates the curvature of this metric, the Gauss curvature k0, and the Gauss curvature k of that. And that, uh, that, that uh, uh, equation is, is, is the following. It can be written in this way. Um, it says the uh, Laplacian of u, this is the Laplacian relative to g0, and then minus k0, <clears throat> and then plus k times e to the 2u uh, is equal to 0. Okay, so in particular, if, if you wanted to start with a given metric and you wanted to make k equal some constant, say, little k, then you would have to solve this differential equation. And that differential equation is, is uh, so it's, a, of course, a nice elliptic equation, but it's also a variational equation. So this, this equation is, is, um, uh, is associated to a variational problem. And one way of writing it is, if you take this part of the equation, then that arises as the, uh, the variation of the Euler-Lagrange equation for a Dirichlet type uh, energy. So there's an energy which is associated to G, where G is given by U, really. And that's just uh, the integral over uh, M of one half the gradient of U squared. And then in order to get that K0 term, it's uh, plus K0 times uh, U, first term. And this is integrated with respect to the background. Zero. And then if you look for extremals of this functional where you normalize the area of the surface, so you require the area of G, which is just the integral uh, on M of e to the 2u, uh, a naught, say to be 1. Okay, so you extremize this thing subject to the constraint that the area is 1. Then when you do that, you produce this oil of equation. So, so there's a, there's a, a variational uh, way of, of, of constructing say, uh, constant curvature metrics, well, where the constant k comes out as a Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so there's a variational approach to constructing these. And, and in fact, it, it's a theorem um, that uh, any constant curvature metric, so we know actually by various arguments that constant curvature metrics always exist in the setting of the zero a compact surface. Um, and it's a theorem that, in fact, the constant curvature metric um, in the conformal class always minimizes this energy. So it actually achieves the minimum. Now that, that theorem is quite easy for surfaces uh, 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 of uh, genus greater than or equal to one. And so for the tori and uh, higher genus surfaces, that's pretty easy to see. This is a, essentially a, a, a convex variational problem. And it has a unique minimum. Now, the, the result for metrics on the two-sphere uh, amazingly only appears in the literature in the early 80s. And it's what's called the Onofre inequality. So th th there's a slightly non-trivial fact here that um, if you take the surface to be S2, the fact that the, co the standard constant curvature metrics uniquely minimize this is called the Onofre inequality. So my feeling is this should have been known back in the 60s or 70s through the work of Trudinger and Moser 
people like that, but it apparently didn't appear explicitly until, until, um, until the 80s. Okay, so um, so the, the fact that the standard metrics on S2 minimize this problem is a slightly slightly uh, non-trivial fact. Now, one of the reasons for um, um, one of the reasons for interpreting constant curvature metrics variationally is it gives an, it gives an approach to, to constructing them. Right? So it's also pretty easy for, um, for sur the surface case to use this variational characterization to construct the constant curvature metrics. So you use fairly standard sorts of easy arguments to do that. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is an attempt to do something similar in three dimensions. So for, for n equals three, there's also a natural uh, variational approach to constructing constant curvature metrics, which in three dimensions are Einstein metrics. So remember, in three dimensions, the basic <coughs> the curvature is really determined by the Ricci tensor. And then the trace of the Ricci is the scalar curvature. Right? So, um, so the constant curvature metrics in three dimensions are the same as Einstein metrics. So they satisfy Ricci is equal to some constant k times R, which is, so this is the scalar curvature. Well, because it's the Ricci scalar. <laughs> Times, uh, sorry. Uh, and, uh, and in three dimensions, those metrics are precisely the, uh, the constant curvature metric. Okay, so, um, so there's, a, there's a natural um, variational or formal construction of these metrics, which is, uh, goes under the name of the uh, Yamabe invariant. And the idea is the following thing. So it, it's actually a classical fact that, the, that the, uh, this uh, equation, the Einstein equation, is the Euler-Lagrange equation for the functional, which is the, uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action, so-called the integral R dv on m. So you look at critical points of that subject to the volume constraint. The, the condition that the volume is one. So for a closed compact manifold, it's, it's an easy calculation, which I think was first done by Hilbert, that if you extremize this functional subject to that constraint, you produce the uh, euler lagrange equation, which is the, uh, the, uh, the Einstein equation. Okay, so um, on the other hand, there's a lot of work on this, and, and and just, I won't go into details, but just to say that this functional is, is highly indefinite. So, so it's easy to find metrics which, uh, you know, for which it goes to infinity and with volume one and for which it goes to minus infinity. So the, the most plausible construction of a critical point for this metric produces what's called the Yamabe invariant. So, so it turns out the right thing to do, or at least a, a good thing to do, is to, uh, is to consider the following. So you consider any metric G on the manifold um, and then you consider what I'll call I of G. So this is the conformal class. So you have to separate the conformal directions from the transverse directions. No problem. Yeah, in general, you get an indefinite functional if you do that. So, so here, I, I would have to subtract something that involves uh, e to the 2u. You can't do that, yeah. But, uh, but then, then the critical point becomes index 1 or something. So uh, I prefer to do it this way. But you're right. There are other ways of setting up variation. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, you could add k, uh, yeah, k times one. Um, or you could also, another thing that you could do is take the ratio of this with the volume to the correct power to make it dimensionless, and then look for extremes of that. That's more commonly done in this subject. You could look at the, the uh, scale invariant uh, einstein Um Okay, so, um, so so uh, the conformal class, so these are, these are just, this class of G is, these are just metrics of the form uh, e to the 2u times G, where u is a function, as I see in the And this i is the infinity. So it turns out to be possible to, uh, this, this turns out to be a well-defined number, functional bounded below. So it's the infinity, let me call this script R of G. 
true already in this for this conformal problem. So if you're in a conformal class where this being ha having this in positive in a conformal class is completely equivalent to the existence of a metric in that class with positive scalar curvature. So that's a that's a uh, easy thing. I'm not sure who first did that. Certainly there's early work by Kazdin and Warner, maybe Yamabe himself. Um, so it's it's so in particular the 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 three manifolds with positive Imabi invariant are precisely those with positive scalar curvature. Positive scalar curvature. So that's a tie-in with Jonathan's talk this morning. Um, and so in particular, um, uh, in particular, if a three manifold doesn't admit a metric of positive scalar curvature, it's uh, Imabi invariant is less than or equal to zero. Now, let me just say that up until, up until this work I'm going to talk about, in three dimensions, we only knew two possible values for Imabi invariant. So it's possible to show, and this, this is related to the work again, the very beginnings of the work which Jonathan talked about, the fact that, for example, flat manifolds don't have metrics with positive scalar curvature. Um, and, and so it's possible to have three manifolds like T3 or other flat manifolds with Yamabe invariant zero. So there are examples of, of um, um, three manifolds with Yamabe invariant zero. This statement is completely equivalent to the statement that T3 has no metric with positive so it's a way of encoding that fact in terms of the, uh, the Yamabe invariant. Okay, so we know the we know that the flat manifolds, uh, in fact, have zero Yamabe invariant, and moreover, the uh, Yamabe the sigma of m is characterized by the flat metric. So part of this also is that, is that the flat metrics uniquely realize that. Okay, so for any for any flat manifold, sigma is zero. So what are the values of sigma? Well, so there's zero possible value. Another value is, is here. Let me call this thing sigma one. Sigma one, it's a positive value. And, and actually, that's all we, we knew up until uh, recently. So, so um, on the other hand, there's a conjecture, which, uh, which is quite likely to be true. Um, the, the conjecture is that, is that, like in the two-dimensional case where the constant curvature metrics always, in fact, minimize and re realize this extremal. It's conjecturally true in three dimensions also. So the conjecture is that is that constant curvature metrics realize their Yamabe invariant. So in other words, they are metrics whose conformal class. So first of all, they minimize in their conformal class. So that's uh, that's known. True, and their conformal class is the best one. That is, it's the largest one on the manifold. So that's, that's the conjecture. So in particular, I'm really going to focus on the case where uh, a positive scalar curvature. So, so the conjectural picture for positive scalar curvature would be the following. Um, um, so <clears throat> if you consider constant curvature metrics, uh, which are positive, constant positive curvature, then of course they're quotients. I mean, we expect them to be quotients of S3. And we expect them to have constant curvature metrics. So what we expect is that there's in fact a sequence of values, one called sigma n, uh, which is uh, the value for S3, sigma 1, divided by n to the two thirds. This is the conjectural Yamabe invariant for uh, a constant curvature manifold. So so uh, this would be a finite fundamental group manifold where the order of the fundamental group is n. So you expect that for a quotient of S3, like a lens space or whatever, the Imabi invariant becomes smaller. It should be n large, in fact, go to zero. And this should be achieved by the standard metric, by the metric. So, so this is what the uh, this is what the conjecture amounts to, at least for quotients of S3. Okay, so um, the, uh, the theorem I want to talk about actually does this in the simplest case, namely when n is 2, so for RP3. And in fact, it does something substantially stronger. So I think we'll get questions. Well, um, um, the evidence is, there's some evidence in that uh, it's true locally. So if you consider metrics which are near the standard metric, you can argue that, uh, that it's true. Um, I'll give you some more evidence in the talk. <laughs> uh, let me give you some other evidence. I should say, by the way, we're, 
a lot better off in four dimensions on this. So in four dimensions, there are a lot of complicated, interesting metrics known which do achieve their Imagen invariant. So, so these are um, due to Claude, the room, and also partly due to joint uh, work with Claude and Gersky. Okay, so they use, so these are spinner arguments. So this uses, in fact, the, the initial argument uses the cipher width equations, four dimensions. Uh, and then there's some other arguments which just use, use spinners. But for example, they're able to show that the standard metric on CP2 realizes its, it's uh, Imagen variant. So these are, these, these involve spinners, partly the nonlinear version in uh, fiber width. So in four dimensions, we do know that the invariant is highly non-trivial. There are lots of four manifolds which, uh, which have you know, many different, different values for the Imagen variant. Okay, so, so this is the first variational uh, in that case, um, yeah, in that case, the, the, of course, it's simply connected. So, uh, right, so if you take quotients of S4, nothing's known about that either. In fact, the methods I'm going to talk about actually are three-dimensional. It'll, it'll be quite hard to generalize the four, I think. Um, so certainly RP4, we don't know. Of course, there aren't many quotients of S4. Um, okay, so um, so this is a, this is a, um, uh, I think a very interesting extremal problem, which I've thought about for many years or wondered about for many years. And, and you can see that the, the, the state of knowledge is very, very primitive. Um, now, there is a little bit more known. And in fact, one of the things which led to this, this connection I want to describe uh, is the following. Actually, before I say that, let me point out another thing. Um, now, um, if you want to get lower bounds on this invariant, so let's let me talk about lower bounds for a minute. So, so, um, so the invariant is the soup of something, right? So in order to get a lower bound on it, all I have to do is find a good conformal class and where I can uh, prove a lower bound on I. So to get lower bounds, I just need to find a good conformal class, find a good G-naught, um, uh, where I can estimate i, so that i of g naught is down to below by something, right? And then, and then the Imabi invariant will be below. Now, there's a there's a good example of that. Um, uh, in, in in particular, it gives it gives an example of another manifold besides S3, which has the same Imabi invariant. So the, the simplest example is um, I think of taking uh, uh, S2 cross S1. So I take a say a unit. Uh, S2, and I cross it with an S1 of length L, and I think of this L as very big, large. So there are, these are product conformal classes, but I can vary the conformal structure by stretching the circle, or I can scale it down so I have just a tiny little S2 and a big S1. So this is the S1 direction, these are S2s. Okay, then um, it's not hard to show that, that when you do this, I mean, if you look at that conformal class, the minimizing metric looks as follows. So it looks like S3, really, except there's a little neck there. These are identified. So in other words, the metric starts to look like a bubble with, with, uh, with a single uh, neck. This can be done rigorously. In fact, you can actually study the solutions of this problem for using ODEs in this, this setting. Or there's actually a more general consideration, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in particular, you can show that you can show that as you take L to infinity, the infimum actually converges to sigma 1. So this is really a, a family of conformal classes. The infimum for these converge upward to sigma 1, that is the value of the sphere. So in particular, you see that sigma of S1 cross S2 is also equal to sigma 1. Okay, and this is, this is an example where, where, the, um, where the invariant is not achieved. So it's only, it's, it's only achieved in this limiting, limiting sense. Now this argument was generalized in an interesting way by uh, O. Kobayashi. Let me just point that out. So um, he observed that if you take the connected sum of two manifolds with positive scalar curvature, and of course it was known before, in fact, Donovan talked about this is this a simple case of the surgery that he talked about. This one also then will be positive. And Okobayashi's theorem gives a lower bound on this. So it's bigger than or equal to uh, the minimum. This is in the positive case. Sigma 1, sigma 2. 
Okay, and, and, and the idea of that, so this is the lower bound of, uh, for the connected sum, and the idea of the proof is that, is that you can think of the connected sum, you can choose a conformal class which makes it look like a disjoint union. So you take that one and two, then you can think of connecting them with a very long, thin tube. And then, and then you have to do some calculation to show that for this conformal class, as you take the tube longer and longer, the Yamabe invariant converges to that of a disjoint union. For a disjoint union, it's very easy to see that the Yamabe invariant is the minimum of the tube. So that's, that's an interesting lower bound. So, so in particular, it tells you that not only is S1 cross S2 Yamabe invariant sigma 1, but you can take any number of connected sums and still, and still get the same. The same thing about the Sigma one. Sigma one is as large as you can go. Um, okay, so now there's um. So I did something a long time ago related to uh, uh, estimating these these invariants. In, in particular, um, I, I showed a long time ago in connection with solving the conformal Yamabe problem, that, um, that in fact, if you take any conformal class, any three manifold, or uh, the, the higher dimensional version as well, with a conformal metric G naught, then, then the, the conformal Yamabe invariant, G naught, is in fact always strictly less than, uh, than, than sigma one. Uh, with equality, it's less less than or equal, say, equal only if uh, um, only if M3G is conformally equivalent to, to S3, the standard S3. The standard so, so in other words, as a conformal class, the, the, the standard one on S3 is, is uniquely characterized by having uh, the largest possible uh, conformal amount of variance. The proof of this, actually, so it's really the proof of this which led to the considerations which I want to talk about here. So, so in fact, it, it, this can be reformulated in the following way, and this turns out to be a useful thing to do. Um, so the, the main idea in this, in a sense, is that, is that um, um, you're dealing with a conformal class here, so it would be nice to be able to choose some, some canonical metric. And, and, and also, and, and there's a way to do that in such a way that you can get some intuition about them. There's some intuition coming from physics, from relativity. So uh, what you can do is choose a point on your manifold, three, so choose a point P, and then um, in the positive case, assuming positive scalar curvature, uh, there's a unique metric in the conformal class, which is uh, really given by the fundamental solution of the, what's called the conformal Laplacian here, which sends this point to infinity. So what I can do is conformally, uh, think of this M3 minus a point as an asymptotically flat manifold. So the point P is now at infinity. And when I do that, the, for this asymptotically flat manifold, the scalar curvature is zero. So this is in the same way that you can take S3, take out a point, and, and conformally uh, think of the, a metric on there, which is the flat metric on R3. You can do that on any, um, on any, um, uh, you can do that conformally on any on, in any class with positive scalar curvature. And moreover, this this well, while there are lots of different choices of conformal metric here, this one is really uniquely determined up to a scale uh, just by the point P. So, so this is a way of, first of all, getting some kind of uh, understanding of these, these, a little better understanding of the metrics. Also, a way of choosing a unique one at least to give them the point P. Okay, and then and then. <laughs> what um, another way to, to, to state this theorem is the following. So if we consider uh, asymptotically flat, non-compact manifolds with zero scalar curvature, we can consider what I'll call the Sobolev constant. So it can be formulated sort of analytically. Um, it, it's actually the same thing as I, but it's just a re rewriting. So, so we can consider the Sobolev constant, which is the impediment over phi, say, of compact support or, or an H1, uh, of the integral of gradient phi squared. This is now on this, uh, this, this manifold, let me call it, say, uh, well, that metric is then divided by p to the, um, uh, in this case, 2 n over n minus 2, so it's 6. 
Okay, so this is the uh, so-called conformal Sobolev inequality. And then this statement here, in fact, is actually equal to, this is really the same as I. This statement that this is less than or equal to sigma 1 is the same as saying that this is less than or equal to the, uh, the conformal Sobolev inequality of R3. Inequality, if and only if. Uh, uh, if m tilde is flat. So, so this can be reformulated as a characterization uh, of R3 among all asymptotically flat zero scalar curvature three manifolds uh, as having the largest Sobolev constant. That turns out to be a useful, uh, useful way of formulating that. And of course the proof, probably some of you know, involves the um, so-called positive mass theorem. Okay, so there's a sort of asymptotic calculation, and the, the, the fact that the positive mass theorem holds uh, is really what gives the strict inequality here. Okay, so this is old work of mine, which is the key result in, in realizing this, this enthemum. So in order to, re to, to prove the enthemum is realized for an arbitrary metric, that was the key, key result in doing that. It's really a characterization of the standard conformal class. Now notice, this doesn't really say anything about the Imabi invariant because uh, this is only a statement about conformal classes. It still could happen, as for S1 cross S2, that there is a sequence of conformal classes where it converges out to the sigma 1. It certainly could still happen. OK, so, so now, um, so the work I want to talk about relates to the case where um, when you do this manifold, when, when you do this opening up procedure, um, uh, the case where you have, a, uh, in relativity, a black hole. So this is a minimal surface or a horizon. So it might happen. It might happen that when you blow this thing up, you produce in this metric a sort of neck, a minimal, uh, minimal surface. In fact, that does necessarily happen if you have suitable topology on the on the manifold you, you start with. Um, and in fact, so this, this sort of relates this question to uh, a extremal problem in relativity, which was, was recently solved in the last year, it's called the Penrose inequality. So the Penrose inequality characterizes a certain metric, namely the Schwarzschild metric. So, uh, so the Penrose inequality comes from relativity, and it has to do with a particular metric. So this is, this is called the Schwarzschild metric. Back, and it's just the metric 1 plus m over 2 r to the fourth times the Euclidean metric, say on r3 minus 0, where r is just, so we have coordinates on r3, r is just uh, mod x. Okay, so this is, this is a very important uh, uh, metric in general relativity. In fact, lots of, lots of calculations physical predictions in relativity are based on are based on, on this metric. And from a physical point of view, this metric is expected to have a, a certain extremal property. Let me describe it. Really so we can picture this metric in the following way. So the you can see that if you take the R equals constant surfaces, they're just round spheres, and the radius of the sphere changes as you change R. And in fact, actually it's maybe not completely obvious from the picture, but the metric really has a, uh, has a reflection symmetry about a, a neck. So this is the Schwarzschild horizon of the black hole. This picture, and this, this occurs here at r equals m over 2. And then as you go to plus infinity, the metric flattens out. And as you go to 0, the metric flattens out also. So this is r goes to infinity. Okay, and this is r goes to 0. In fact, the tube is really an isometric reflection across r equals m over 2. And so in particular, this is a, a least area surface. It's a, it's a minimal surface. And if you do a little calculation, so one thing that's important in relativity is the area of the black hole, the area of the horizon. And if you compute the area, you can easily see that there's a relationship between the mass and the area. Namely, the mass is the square root of the area over 16 pi. So that's just a calculation using that, that 
parametric this computing area of that of that uh, R equals M over two uh, surface. And um, now the the physical picture, the the Schwarzschild solution in relativity is a rotation symmetric black hole with nothing else going on outside. So the Penrose inequality conjectures that if you have some other, some arbitrary initial data set, so, so satisfying, say, the vacuum Einstein equations or some physically reasonable situation, in, in, in particular what that amounts to, in the simplest case at least, is that the scalar curvature is zero, or actually it's true for non-negative scalar curvature. If I take an arbitrary metric with non-negative scalar curvature, and if I have a horizon that is a least area surface with area A, so if I have a, a uh, asymptotically flat um, zero scalar curvature metric with a minimal surface, the, the surface always is a two-sphere, in this case, topologically, uh, then, then the idea is because there's no gravitational energy outside the horizon that all of the mass should be due to the area of the horizon. So the Penrose inequality says for a general, uh, uh, for a general metric like that, it should be true that the mass is always greater than or equal to square root of a over 16 pi, with equality only for the short scale. It's called the Penrose inequality. <laughs> okay, so so. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you want to, you can think your met that your metric is actually asymptotic to one of these Schwarzschild metrics at infinity, and then the mass is just the mass of that Schwarzschild. There's also a more complicated integral. It, it's some sort of flux integral at in infinity, which I won't write down. But it, it's something that's uh, that's well defined and can be computed for metrics which are asymptotically flat, say in the sense that they're Euclidean plus terms of order one over r. Then you can, you can define a mass provided the scalar curvature is. Okay, so that's uh, that, that's the Penrose inequality. This this was solved uh, by well for, for connected horizons by Kluskin uh, and Ullmann uh, three or four years ago, and more recently in the general case by Bray, Bray by rather different different arguments. Okay, so um, yeah, it's uh, yeah. So that, that's a good point too. Um, so um, the the horizon has to be um, minima, it has to be minimal, zero mean curvature, but also you're not allowed to have any other horizons outside, because otherwise it's false. I mean, you can construct spaces which sort of have a neck, you know, one horizon here, and then an enclosing one, which is very tiny, and then this inequality is violated. So it's important that the horizon be what's called outer minimizing. So, so it's small, it's smaller area than any enclosing surface. And you can always construct, given any space, you can always find such a such an outer minimum. Um, it's always a two-sphere, just from the second variation. Well, it's stable, so, it's, so it'll be a two-sphere. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, so the thing, I mean, the observation that I made, and I, I actually sent my student Nevs working on it before Bray got involved, uh, was uh, the observation is that if you if you consider RP3, a very simple observation, if you consider RP3 with its standard metric, so you just take a constant curvature metric P naught, and then if you do this conformal procedure where you blow up, then well see that's equivalent to so you can think of RP3 as as S3 with antipodal points identified. Then if you blow up at a point, I mean right here, then that's equivalent to blowing up S3 at the points P and minus T. And when you do that blow up, you get exactly the Schwarzschild metric. So the Schwarzschild metric, in fact, arises directly in this setting. Uh, uh, you, when you do the blow up and produces zero scalar curvature metric, you get exactly the Schwarzschild. Okay, so, so RP3, so you really get, so you can think of RP3 minus a point as being half of the Schwarzschild, where you identify antipodal points on the boundary. So this boundary is, then becomes an RP2 boundary. And the metric here is exactly the, the Schwarzschild metric. So that's RP3 minus point. 
Okay, so in particular, then, the question of whether this, that metric achieves the Imabi invariant on, uh, on, for RP3 is equivalent. It can be formulated again in terms of Sobolev constants. Okay? So, so it's a question about the Schwarzschild metric, and it's a question of whether the Sobolev constant, so now I consider an arbitrary, so this is the picture for the standard metric. If I take any metric now, then I have some you know, funny picture. Um, except this is, of course, antiphilly invariant. And then when I blow it up, I get some funny zero scalar curvature metric, which is asymptotically flat. Tilde, again, <coughs> the same, it's on the same manifold, so it's, <coughs> it exists on the Schwarzschild space. And then, and then the, 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 the characterization we want to prove is that the Sobolev constant of G Tilde is, in fact, less than or equal to the Sobolev constant of uh, the Schwarzschild component, G sub s. Well, it's really G sub s mod T2, right? So G sub s, so this is on RP2, RP3 minus, uh, minus uh, a point. Okay, so, um, so it reduces to this particular question. So, so the, the two things have a great formal similarity. Um, here you're asking for uh, a characterization of this metric in terms of its Sobolev constant. And here, we're asking what could well be a related question, which is, which is uh, uh, a mass characterization uh, uh, in terms of the area of the horizon. And, and so, I asked my student to look at the proofs of the Penrose inequality and see whether he could prove this one. So, what he, did, what he started doing, he started in the wrong direction. He looked at Bray's proof. Penrose inequality. Bray's proof is pretty complicated. He, he constructs a, a kind of conformal flow, which is which is quite complicated. In particular, the, the separation between the surfaces of the flow isn't all that well controlled. So then Bray looked at it, and he looked at Huskin and Hillman's proof, which is the one over H flow, and it turns out to work beautifully for this problem. So I, I like to describe those, those results. Um, So, um, well, so let me first state the theorem, so, uh, since I'm likely to run out of time here. Um, okay, so, um, so, so in fact, what are the results obtained? Well, for one thing, they do prove that sigma of RP3 is equal to sigma 2. So sigma 2, remember, is sigma 1 over 2 to the 2 thirds. Right? So it's strictly less than, less than sigma 1. But as a byproduct of it, actually, they are able to pretty much, plat well, pretty much, let me say precisely. So um, as a byproduct, they also prove that if you consider a three-manifold, M3, uh, whose Yamabe invariant is bigger than sigma 1, sorry, bigger than sigma 2. So remember the Yamabe invariant is sigma 1, which is the sphere, sigma 2 is here, sigma 3, etc. So the three manifolds above sigma 2 and possibly below sigma 1, um, if M3 is any three manifold with this property, and there's, there, there are a couple of cases they're having a hard time handling, but, but if M3 is prime, say it's not, it's not a connected sum, it's a prime three manifold, then, then there are only four cases. M3 is either S3, S2 cross S1, RP2 cross S1, or there's also a non-trivial uh, S2, there's a, a non-trivial S2 bundle over S1. So, so these last three are all related to S2 cross S1. Okay, so, and in fact, all of these, together with their connected sums by Kobayashi's theorem, these all have invariant sigma one. As we know, this is, it's not hard to see that these also have invariant sigma one. So in particular, there's nothing in between sigma two and sigma one. Uh, and the ones above sigma 2, the prime ones at least, are all, are all those. And um, if you look at manifolds down here at sigma 2, then of course there's RP3. And, and actually they also can show the connected sums of RP3 are here. Um, <clears throat> but um, there's a question, actually there, there are certain mixed cases that are a little hard to resolve. They're, they're not able, for example, to resolve RP3 connected sum with S1 cross S2, whether it's here or there or somewhere in between. 
it may well be up here actually. So, um, uh, so that there's something slightly involved there. Um, so, so another corollary of this, of course, is that is that uh, if I have a simply connected three manifold, so a possible counterexample to the uh, Poincaré conjecture, then then Ichimabi invariant <coughs> must be strictly less than less than or equal to sorry less than or equal to one. Okay, so in particular, it shows also that the Yamabe invariant does distinguish a homotopy three, uh, three sphere from from, uh, from the standard one. Uh, not six two. Yeah, so thank you. Of course, you'd like to say a lot more than that, but but at least it. So, um, okay, and let me let me give the idea of the proof. I only have about ten minutes left, but um, so the so again the authors of this theorem uh, are Gray and S. Okay. and they're uh, <coughs> they're writing it up right now. Um, so the, um, the, uh, the, the proof goes like this. Okay, so um, in fact, what, what this starts with really is, uh, uh, is an arbitrary, um, is an arbitrary scalar flat asymptotically flat metric so you have some arbitrary one here. I just draw that sort of wiggly with the horizon. So it's important that there be a horizon here. So it's the existence of the horizon which forces the 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 uh, uh, invariant to be smaller. It's also very important that this horizon bound a compact region. Okay? So what fails in S2 cross S1 is that you will generally have two horizons which are joined, and that's bad. So you need because the argument uses we want to construct a function by its level sets. So so we're going to. So the idea is to. So, so let's think of a single horizon which bounds a compact region in space, and we want to compare this wiggly picture to the Schwarzschild above its horizon. Okay. So so um, we're interested in these Sobolev constants. Right. So so we know we know Schwarzschild explicitly, and we know it's so, we know. We know the function which achieves the Sobolev count. Don't ask me to tell you what it is, but but there's a function whose level sets are these spheres, which achieves the Sobolev count. It's simply the conformal factor, which which closes up the end and puts you gives you the standard metric. Okay, so there's a function here which we know, and its level sets, and it has all the symmetry of RP3. So its level sets are the standard spheres. Okay. So what we want to do in order to prove an upper bound on this, remember this is the infimum over some some family of functions. What we want to do is produce a function on this space, which has smaller Sobolev quotient. So the Sobolev quotient is here. So we're interested in producing a function phi in our unknown metric, and in such a way that we can compare the Sobolev quotients. And so the idea is first to find the level sets of phi. So we know the level sets here are spheres. We want to find what the level sets are here. And so what we want to do So what we want to do is find some natural family of surfaces, which hopefully are, are spheres, and then we want to sort of mimic the function here back there. That's the basic idea. Okay, so it sounds like a great idea, but how do you do it? Well, it, it, it turns out that if you take these surfaces which flow under the um, 1 over h flow, it's called, okay, so there's an interesting flow which was used by Huskin and Ullman and, and studied by them, which is the flow which takes a surface sigma and flows opposite to the mean to the mean curvature. So the mean curvature here points in. Let's let's think of a let's think of a uh, a surface with say positive mean curvature. The mean curvature vector say points in. We want to flow it outward and we want to flow it with a speed. We want to move with a speed of one over h. One over the mean curvature. So this is the flow that's defined for 
um, surfaces with positive mean curvature, and it moves, it's an expanding flow, it, it, it increases the area. In fact, this flow is uniquely determined by the fact that if you compute the rate of change of the area, so in general, the rate of change of the area is the inner product of the, the speed with the mean curvature. Well, the speed is 1 over h. So for this flow, this is just a. So the area under this flow, assuming we, we can be constructed, is precisely, so the a of t is precisely a naught times e to the t. So, this, so you know the area of the surfaces in this flow. Now what Huskin and Ilmanen did is they produced a global unique solution of this flow, but, it, but it's a weak solution. That is, it, it has some gaps, jumps. So, so you get this foliation by surfaces. You can start, well, the horizon has h equals 0, but you can just move up a little bit, and then it just moves quickly in the beginning. And then it, and then it, it exists. So the flow is defined. And actually, when it comes to things like this, it will typically jump over them. So, so the, the flow is actually a level set flow. So the, these surfaces are given by some level sets of the function, in fact, the ellipsis function. So uh, f equals t. And in general, f can be constant on some open region. So the level sets, so this is f equals 0. And the level sets go up. And it can happen that the function is constant on a region. You can have jumps, and then, and then the, uh, the flow persists. In fact, what who's going to know them is they constructed this flow so that when t goes to infinity, it converges to round spheres. Uh, in the asymptotic end. OK, and, and this flow actually has a really interesting history. It was originally um, written down by Garrosh as an attempt to prove the positive energy theorem. Um, and Garrosh observed that there's a certain mass quantity. It's called the Hawking mass, which is monotone under this flow. And that's really the key to this whole, whole argument. So it, it turns out if you write down what's called the Hawking mass, so mh for a, a two-dimensional surface, which is say an S2, the Hawking mass is the square root of a over 16 pi, and then times 1 minus 1 over 16 pi, times the sort of Wilmore function, the integral of x squared. It's called the Hawking mass. And it has the property that if you evaluate it on the Schwarzschild solution, it's just a constant. So when h is 0, you're on the horizon, it's just square root of a over 16 pi. As you go to infinity, the function is actually constant. And, and you know, at infinity, you're picking up the mass. So it turns out this quantity is monotone under the flow. Basic okay, so property is increasing in T under the flow. So that was the basic idea, the key point of the the uh, the is proof. Okay, so another way to write down this equation, so so I mean the idea to see that this is going to give you something on the related to the slope of inequality is that this flow. If you think of it as a level set flow, this function f satisfies the condition. So its mean curvature as a level set, the mean curvature, of course, is the divergence of the normalized gradient. So this is h for, the level, for a level set as we give our students the differential geometry problem. Of course, they never solved it. But, right. <laughs> this is the, uh, right. So this is actually the mean curvature of the, uh, of the, uh, of the level set. OK, and then and the speed of the flow, if, you have, if the flow is defined as level sets of a function, is 1 over the gradient. So the equation, the 1 over h flow, is this equation. So in particular, you can see the gradient of f is equal to h. So this, this integral h squared here is exactly gradient of f squared. So you see it's, it's giving you, and this is monotone, so that means that this, fun, this term here is bounded above. So the, the difference is bounded below by what it was initially. And, uh, and that gives you an upper bound on this quantity. So you can see that you're sort of estimating terms of the type that appear in the city So you have to worry about the volume on the bottom, too. But, but uh, the point is, OK, so the idea then is you compare the two flows. So here you know the flow explicitly. You know exactly what function to choose. So there's, there's some function here, phi, which is a function of f, which is the best one. So what you do is you transplant, let's call this f bar. Right? You transplant the same function back here, that is p of f. And then you show that when you put that into the uh, Sobolev quotient, you get a better answer, a smaller answer. 
that's that's the basic idea. So it's, a, it's actually very neat, compact. I mean, the proof isn't really very long. It uses the co-area formula. You have to worry a little about the fact the flow jumps, but but uh, but uh, it all fits together really neatly. So so this uh, right. So it provides a. Uh, very interesting connection, I think, between these two problems, the Penrose inequality and the, the uh, Imagine variant for R3. Now, these other results follow. So, in order to prove these, you just have to study, you have to combine the, um, you know, that result with the existence theory for minimal surfaces, right? So, you have to use another key ingredient here is the uh, Meek Simon Yao theorem on existence and isotopy classes. Because this argument doesn't work unless you have a horizon. So in order to construct the horizons, you need to use the, the existence theory. And to do something like the, uh, you know, like a fake, like a fake S3, you have to use the existence theory in this isotopic set. So you have to say the sphere at infinity is isotopic to some uh, minimal surface. So if it's, so if the, if the, if the, uh, if the manifold is not a standard sphere, then you can always find the horizon, and then this argument. I should have said, by the way, this, this, this function, as it's, as it's defined, it only exists on the end. But that's why it's important that there be a compact piece that's bounded here. So, so here you just take d to be a constant. It's a constant on the boundary. So, so uh, you just take a constant there. And you see, that, that makes the inequality even better. Because, because phi is constant, so there's no contribution to the numerator, but the denominator is bigger. So in fact, if you can argue there's a lot of volume behind the horizon, you can actually do better in so, so understanding how much is hidden, how much volume there is behind the horizon uh, is very important to trying to uh, extend this, this argument. Um, so I should say there, there are many, many interesting questions. And that, you know, this is, but, but on the other hand, the fact that this is, in a way, is relatively difficult. I mean, it took. 15 years to put all this stuff together, and it uses, you know, it uses a whole bunch of a whole bunch of stuff. It's sort of, I mean, you know, you might think that well, maybe these things are just too hard, which is possibly true. But uh, uh, but but I, I I hope I mean I'm hoping that there's some way of understanding this which will give a much better um, much better better understanding of these things. Of course, there's a very important problem here generally, which I, this doesn't touch at all. Which is the problem of uh, uh, proving the existence for this Yamabe metric in some, you know, some large class of manifolds. That's, that's another one separate, separate issue. These, these methods are just ways of giving estimates of bounding it. So really, they're ways of giving upper bounds. <coughs> upper, it's a way of giving an upper bound on, on the uh, Yamabe invariant. Anyway, I thought it was interesting, so I thought I'd get to talk on it. So maybe I'll stop here. Sigma two. Yeah, at sigma two. Right. Yeah. Well, then, then you run into the same problem of. Uh, I mean, you can prove. Part of this does say that for a conformal class, you're always strictly below unless you're actually on the RP three with the standard metric. But there's always the concern that you could have a sequence which goes up. So, so uh, this method, I, I, I don't think will characterize the manifold at sigma two. I think that would be a, you know, an additional step. But certainly, may, may be quite hard. But well, certainly, you see that you take RP3 and add on that and connect to some of the, say, any of those manifolds, that's one of the ones that will be at Sigma 2 still. And there can be. Uh, no, uh, no, actually, uh, that's, <laughs> that, that's, not, that's not clear. The, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Kobayashi inequality allows the possibility that Sigma goes up under connected sum. This may actually be a case where it goes up. Uh, the, the trouble is, so, so if, you take, if you take RP3 connect with S2 cross S1, you have to know that when you open it up, that there's a horizon which bounds the compact region. See, because of the S2 cross S1, it might happen that the horizons actually are joined, and then you're in a similar picture as the S2 cross S1. And that's sort of the way they're thinking at the moment. 
but that, that case is still not resolved. Uh, it's certainly not obvious at all that the uh, that uh, you're at sigma two. No. That in itself would be interesting, I think, to give a, an example of a connected sum where the uh, Yamaha invariant jumps up. I guess there's no example of something like that, or do you have one? In, you've done some things in four dimensions. Uh, yes. Um, no, certainly it does. There are many of them. There, I see. Okay. So this may may be a three-dimensional example where that happens. I mean, so in particular, you can, in four dimensions, you can take two things with negative Yamabe invariant. Oh. Uh, that has positive Yamabe invariant. Okay. Uh, now, this theorem actually is for positive invariant. I think the statement. But you could also. You can do it for positive, positive. also. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, right. Um, it's not known. Um, actually, I didn't say so, but th this argument that the Hawking mass is increasing is very two-dimensional. It uses the gauss bonnet theorem on the, on the surfaces. So no, I, I think that, uh, I don't think there's a, I mean, Bray was looking at some things like that, but certainly this type of argument 